Perfect, thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Leah Tate, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the February meeting of the California Board of Psychology, and this will be a two-day meeting. I would like to call the meeting to order and ask that Ms. Bruteau please call the roll to establish quorum. Good morning. Kasuga. Here. Cervantes. Here. Fu. Hi. Harp Sheets. Here. Nystrom. Here. Phillips. Here. Riscate. Here. Rogers. Here. Tate. Here. Roll is complete. Thank you and quorum is established. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us for our first meeting of 2022. The Board of Psychology continues to evolve with the profession and navigate alongside the new COVID variant. The board is full of committed individuals and we are excited to continue moving forward. Just as a reminder, our mission is to protect consumers of psychological services by licensing psychologists, regulating the practice of psychology and supporting the evolution of the profession. I'm excited to start the new year and commemorate our first 2022 meeting with a mindfulness exercise by our very own Dr. Shikanda Rogers. Dr. Rogers. Thank you, Dr. Tate. I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to lead us through a mindfulness exercise as we get ready to engage in the business of <clears throat> navigating through our agenda today. Um, in order to be able to do that, I think it's important that all minds and hearts are clear. So we'll do a brief mindfulness exercise for about 10 minutes just allowing ourselves to settle into the present moment, um, welcome ourselves to the meeting, um, settle our minds, settle our hearts, and settle our bodies uh, before we get into the work for the day. So as we begin, I'll ask you to take a position that's comfortable for you um, while we have this practice. That position could be seated that position could be lying down, that position could be standing. Um, if you are seated, uh, feel free to close your eyes. And if that's not available, and if that doesn't feel comfortable, you can just lower your gaze softly. And for the next 10 minutes, there's nothing to do, nowhere to go, nowhere to be, only being here in this present moment in the body. And so we'll start with a mindfulness exercise connecting to our breath. So that will be our focus today. So centering yourself into a posture that is both dignified and also at ease. My mindfulness teacher says upright but not uptight. So finding a, pos a position that's supportive for your practice. And just getting comfortable for these few moments before we connect to the breath. Feeling both feet flat on the floor. Maybe noticing your back against the chair. And for these next few minutes, just bringing yourself home, home to the body, home to the breath, home to the heart, and home to the here and now. One of the beautiful things about a mindfulness practice with the breath is that the breath is always with us. Taking a breath was the very first thing we did when we entered into this world. Taking a breath will be the last thing we do before we exit the world. 
and taking a breath is something that we do every moment in between. So it always connects us to the present moment and it is a, a portal to the here and now. And just checking in for a moment with the body, maybe doing a gentle body scan to notice what's present. Any sensations that are arising. And not getting caught up in what you notice, but just simply having an awareness of what is. And letting it be. Doing a soft and gentle check of any thoughts that are present without getting caught into the story or the narrative of those thoughts, but just noticing and letting those be. And now focusing our attention on the breath. If it's helpful for you, you can take two or three breaths that are just a bit deeper than you normally would, just to help you sense that place in the body where you feel your breath the most. Maybe you center your attention on the nostrils as the air flows in. Or maybe you place a hand on the chest or the belly, noticing how the chest and the belly rise on the inhale and then fall away on the exhale. And after you've taken those few breaths, Return to breathing normally. The goal here is not to change the breath or manipulate the breath in any way. It's about trusting the abundant wisdom in our bodies to breathe just right. Our lungs have been breathing us for a lifetime. And so we're just feeling into the sensation of breathing in and breathing out. Seeing if you can track your breath for an entire cycle. The inhale and the exhale. And if your mind wanders, which it is prone to do, simply notice that your mind has wandered and bring yourself back to the breath. Noticing again the inhale and the exhale. of this breath right here.
in this breath right here. Maybe noticing if you can touch the very small, almost imperceptible pause between the inhale and the exhale. Staying connected to the rising and the falling of the chest. And as we notice each breath as it develops, allowing any tension in the body that isn't needed to be released with each exhale. So softening any places of tension, tightness, holding, constriction. so that we have ease, spaciousness, clarity, allowing ourselves to feel rooted, anchored and grounded by our breath. And if your attention has wandered away, notice where the mind drifts in those quiet moments. And gently bring it back. Allowing yourself to be just as you are, in this present moment, breathing in and breathing out, right here and right now. And when you're ready, you can gently open your eyes and return your attention back into the room. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Thank it's amazing you so much. To <laughs> before we join um, board business. Yeah. Thank you. So we will be moving on to agenda, agenda item number three. This is public comment for items not on the agenda. And the board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during this public comment section except to decide whether to place the matter on the agenda of a future meeting. And before I invite speakers to come forward for public comment, I would ask that individuals making comments to not discuss the specifics, including names as to pending complaints, pending licensing applications, or pending disciplinary actions that may come before the board for a decision. Such discussions are considered ex parte communications as they could provide information to the members that is outside of the record in violation of the Administrative Procedure Act. And while there may be a desire to engage in further discussion with comments during this time, the board may not discuss or take action on any matter raised during this time. 
This may give the impression we're not being responsive, but these procedures are critical to ensure the compliance with the Open Meetings Act and to avoid compromising the speaker's goals or the board's mission. Ms. Moderator, can you please open public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment for items not on the agenda, please click that question mark within the square located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen and click um, and in the ask field type comment and then send to all panelists. I'll go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to uh, submit the requests. All right, this is the moderator. Uh, it appears there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, thank you very much. So our next agenda item starts at 930, which is a petition hearing. Ms. Bond, do we need to take a break and wait until the 930 time? Um, if, if you have everyone here, let's see. I think if everyone involved in the petition is here, I think it's reasonable to move. But of course, if there are any objections, we can that set 930 time. I think I'm looking at the list. I believe Deputy Attorney General is here. Judge Liu is here. I believe everyone is here. So let's uh, go ahead, or am I incorrect, Ms. Moderator? Uh, this is the moderator. Um, I don't see any of our petitioners online. Um, so we may um, either need to wait for them to join at 930 or uh, reach out. Okay, we'll wait till 930, but maybe we should skip ahead to our meeting minutes from our November 18th, 19th meeting for possible approval. This is agenda item 16. Is everyone caught up with me? <laughs> Any discussion from board members regarding these minutes? Uh, this is Dr. Harpsheets. I make a motion that we approve the minutes from the November 2021 meeting. I second. This is Dr. Kasuga. Perfect, thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Proteau, can you call the roll, please? Oh, pardon me. If you could just um, do that extra step of asking for public comment. Oh, uh, I am so sorry. I was oh, fast forwarding okay. myself. <laughs> okay. Ms. Moderator, can you please open for public comment? This is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. Go ahead and pause a moment to allow the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. All right, it appears there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank okay. you so much. Any other discussion from the board? Seeing none, Ms. Proteau, can you please call the roll for the second time? Kasuga. Aye. Cervantes. Aye. 
Who? I. Carb Sheaves. I. Nystrom. I. Phillips. I. Riscate. I. Rogers. I. Tate. I. Thank you. Thank you. That motion passes. So let's jump to agenda item number 14, the executive officer's report. Ms. Sorek. Okay. Um, included in your meeting materials is the executive officer's report. Um, and I have uh, only one additional update. Uh, we did have a promotion from a licensing unit to the enforcement unit. Um, we had a staff service analyst in the licensing unit promote to um, AGPA, Associate Government Program Analyst in enforcement. So excited about that. Um, however, we now have a vacancy in licensing uh, that we are hoping to fill within the next month. So um, that was posted this month. So we will need to uh, conduct interviews and um, go through the hiring process for that. No uh, new information on uh, any other vacancies or um, anything there. Hopefully we'll be static for some time now. And then attached um, to the executive officer's report is just the current waiver update. And I'm happy to take any questions uh, the board might have or the public. I don't see any, sorry, I was on mute. I don't see any uh, commenters or questions. Let's move on. Thank you, Ms. Sorek. And I'm happy to take any questions from the public for public comment on this item. Thank you. Can you please open public comment, Ms. Moderator? Yes, uh, this is a moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. And it looks like we do have a request for comment from Elizabeth Winkleman. Elizabeth, I will request to unmute your microphone. Please click the unmute me button when the prompt appears on your device. Dr. Elizabeth Winkleman from the California Psychological Association. Uh, I just wanted to ask Ms. Sorek um, if what the status is of the remote supervision grace period and uh, when is it, it, I think that is part of the COVID-19 update, uh, but if I'm in the wrong section, let me know. And uh, when's the current um, date that it will be expiring and if, it, and if you are considering extending that as uh, we've heard from many, many members and psycho both psychologists who are supervisors and trainees, how important that is and continues to be for them. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you for the question. Um, currently, the declared emergency um, is still in place um, and that is what is giving the board the authority um, to consider waiving uh, some of the uh, regula regulations, um, including uh, the telesupervision uh, provision. Um, Right now, that waiver from the board, it was a six month waiver and that ends March 31st. Um, if a declared emergency is still in place when it gets closer, we would consider uh, extending that another six months or, or until the uh, declared emergency is lifted, whichever occurs first. So um, that is the, the current state of the waiver and then how we'll be addressing that um, if the declared emergency is still in place. Was that helpful? Um, yes, thanks very much. And um, 
just, I'm sure you've noted also the um, importance and for for the uh, supervisees and supervisors, and I'm very glad to hear that you have that um, for consideration. Thank you. All right, this is the moderator. It appears there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you very much. So we have a few more minutes. Let's jump to agenda item 15. This is the president's report. For this agenda item, we have listed all the current board members and the committees that they are serving on. There have not been any significant shifts uh, this year on committees at this time. We've also included the meeting calendar for 2022. And as far as we can project, it looks like we will be WebEx for April and August and perhaps an in-person meeting in November, but that is still up in the air. Any comments from board members at this time? Okay. Can we open up public comment, Ms. Moderator? This is the moderator, not the direction of the board. I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. All right, uh, seeing no requests for public comment, would you like me to close that Q&A panel? Yes, thank you. So it looks like we have about three minutes left. Um, Ms. Moderator, is our petitioner online? Uh, yes, this is the moderator. Uh, we do have our petitioner and it looks like we also have a court reporter. So I'm gonna go ahead and promote them and do mic checks real quick. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, um, so I promoted our court reporter, uh, Sean Mickelier. And Sean, can I get a quick mic check from you? Hi, this is Sean. Good morning, I can hear you, thank you. All right, and I will be uh, promoting up our petitioner. And Dr. Horton, can I get a quick mic check from you? Good morning. Good morning, I can hear you, thank you. Okay. So our next agenda item is a petition hearing. This is item number four. Uh, the administrative law judge will be Judge Liu. Would you like to take over at this time? Good morning, thank you. Um, my name is Jonathan Liu. I'm with the State Office of Administrative Hearings. Um, moderate, let me confirm please that we're going forward with audio only. Is that the, the practice of this board? That is correct. Okay. And uh, we are hearing three petition hearings today. This is the first of three. And uh, it involves a Miss, excuse me, Dr. Selena Horton. Dr. Horton, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can hear you. Okay, Dr. Horton, we're doing a hearing. In ideal circumstances, we'd be in the same room together and you'd see the faces of indiv individuals. And um, unfortunately, uh, these are the circumstances that we have today and we're gonna do the best we can. I understand that we have a moderator and she will be assisting us throughout. If people have technical difficulties or questions, I'm sure there's a way that uh, that could easily be remedied. So let me first indicate that this is the Board of Psychology. All nine members are present. In a moment, we're going on the record. We have a court reporter. His name is Sean McC uh, McClear, and I, I hope I got that name right. Mr. McAleer. We have also representing the Department of Justice, a Deputy Attorney General. And uh, let me confirm, that's Aaron L. Lent. Is that correct, Mr. Lent? Yes, Your Honor, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Lent is 
representing the people of the state of California. Uh, in the past, you may have had the deputy attorney general representing the the board, uh, but today, in a petition for re excuse me for um, termination of probation, uh, he's here to assist in providing the board with background on this case. And as we go forward, there are some procedural errors where he'll be very helpful. Um, at this point, I am going to go on the record, and at that time, I will explain some other procedural matters, and then we'll go from there. So, Mr. Reporter, we are now on the record. We are hearing a petition for early termination of probation. The petition was filed in May of 2021 by Dr. Selena Horton. It has the board's case number 600-2021-000508 as well Office of Administrative Hearings case number 2021-120-335. As indicated earlier, my name is Jonathan Liu. I'm an administrative law judge retired with the State Office of Administrative Hearings. We are called from time to time to assist boards in um, conducting hearings such as this one. The petitioner is present and representing the Department of Justice is Mr. Aaron Lent. Prior to going on the record, Mr. Lent had filed a request for a protective order sealing confidential records. Specifically, uh, there is an exhibit for AGL numbers, what pages 104 through 150, and uh, it contains, I, I believe, um, confidential and sensitive materials. The request is not opposed. The request is granted an order to that effect, sealing and protecting these materials from public disclosure was issued yesterday. Now, let me just briefly discuss the procedures that we'll be following. I'm going to ask Mr. Lent to provide board members with an overview of this case. It will refresh uh, their history before going forward. Uh, after that history is provided, I am going to administer an oath to you, Dr. Horton. And uh, following that oath, uh, I'm going to invite you to make a statement to the board members. Uh, the board members have already received a copy of your petition, so it's not necessary for you to go over any of those same materials. My experience with boards is that they are typically very well prepared and versed in the history of these cases. Rather, I will invite you to comment on matters that you'd either highlight, wish to highlight from that petition, and as importantly, to provide board information that they can consider relating to the, I believe, two or two plus years from the filing of the petition, new information, new material that would be relevant in their considerations. Following your statement, I'm going to invite Mr. Lent to ask you questions to elicit information that will be helpful to board members. And finally, I will ask individual board members to um, ask any questions that they may have. And board members, I'm, I have a list, and it will basically be alphabetical orders, but I'll ask uh, first president and vice president board members to um, ask questions first. When that process is done, I will ask you and also Mr. Lent whether you have anything that you'd like to state in closing. After that, the matter will be closed, and the board will go into closed session, and a decision on your request will issue typically in a matter of weeks. Um, during the course of these proceedings, if you have any confusion or questions about what's happening, feel free to interrupt and the moderator will direct us as appropriate. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and ask Mr. Lent to go forward and provide us with a brief history of this case. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, uh, Your Honor, uh, board members, Madam Moderator, and Dr. Horton. Uh, my name is Deputy Attorney General Aaron Lent. I'm appearing on behalf of the Attorney General of the state of California. And as uh, Judge Liu has indicated, I'm here to assist uh, both Your Honor and uh, members of this board uh, in a fact-finding hearing. My role is not adversarial in nature but is merely intended to protect public interest and ensure that Your Honor and this panel have adequate information to make an informed decision in this matter. 
For the record, both petitioner, Dr. Horton, and the Attorney General's office have waived their rights for an in-person hearing today, and both parties do wish to proceed with the petition hearing by way of telephonic audio only. Five exhibits have been submitted, prepared, and uh, filed both with the board and petitioner. Those exhibits are marked one through five. Those exhibits have an exhibit index, and each in exhibit has a bait stamp number in the bottom right corner identified as AGO. At this time, I have conferred with the petitioner, Dr. Horton. There is no objection to those five exhibits being marked and entered into evidence, and there is a stipulation as to their admissibility and foundation. Dr. Horton has petitioned for a penalty reduction in this matter, seeking an early termination of her probation. She is currently serving a five-year-long probation period that became effective March 24th of 2019, following a statement of issues that was filed on November 7th, 2017, for board case number 600-2017-00802, which was subsequently told for over seven months from the effective date, March 24th, 2019, through October 30th, 2019. Petitioner's probation status is currently active with a projected completion date of October 31st, 2024, which is over two years and eight months from today's date. A brief background concerning the petitioner's uh, disciplinary matter is the following. On or about June 26th of 2017, the California Board of Psychology received an application for registration as a psychological assistant from the petitioner. The board denied the application on August 8th, 2017, and a statement of issues was issued on November 7th, 2017 for board case number 600-2017-00802. Based on petitioner appealing the denial of her licensure. The statement of issues charged three causes of denial for petitioner's application. The first, a conviction of substantially related crime. The second, commission of dishonest, fraudulent, or corrupt acts. And the third, committing acts constituting grounds for discipline of a licensee. These charges stemmed from seven separate instances in which the petitioner was caught by law enforcement and subsequently subsequently convicted of the following crimes. The first, a misdemeanor theft violation of California Penal Code Section 484, Subdivision A, in February of 2017, where a petitioner was sentenced to serve three days in county jail. The second conviction, a misdemeanor fraudulent use of an access card in violation of California Penal Code Section 484E as in Edward, Subdivision C, in April of 1997, in which petitioner was employed by Fry's Electronics and assisted her aunt in attempting to use a stolen credit card to purchase over $1,100 in merchandise from the store. Petitioner had agreed to let her aunt use the stolen credit card knowing it was stolen and in exchange promised her aunt, uh, promised by her aunt, petitioner would receive a Nintendo game video system in two games. Petitioner was caught and convicted and sentenced to three years probation was ordered to serve 12 days in county jail and stay away from Fry's electronic store. The third conviction, a misdemeanor petty theft with a prior conviction in violation of California Penal Code Section 666, Subdivision C, which occurred in May of 1998, whereby petitioner stole several personal hygiene products from a Rite Aid store. Petitioner was sentenced to three years probation and ordered to serve 60 days in county jail, pay restitution, and stay away from the Rite Aid store. Her fourth conviction, a misdemeanor theft in violation of California Penal Code Section 484, Subdivision A, which took place in May 1998, whereby petitioner concealed several articles of clothing in her jacket and exited a Target store without paying for the stolen items. Petitioner was sentenced to two years of probation in order to serve one day in county jail, pay fines and fees, and uh, serve community work service. On April 8th of 2020, on 2002, 
Petitioner was found by that court to be in violation of her probation for that matter by failing to submit proof of her community work service and for failing to pay the court ordered fines. Her probation was revoked and she was ordered to serve 11 additional days in county jail. Her fifth conviction, a misdemeanor driving a vehicle while her privileges were suspended in violation of California Vehicle Code Section 14601.1 Subdivision A, which resulted in the court denying her probation and ordering her to serve 15 days in county jail in January of 2003. Her sixth conviction, a misdemeanor false, falsely making a representation of identity to a peace officer in violation of California Penal Code Section 148.9 Subdivision A, again occurring in January of 2003, whereby petitioner falsely represented her identity to a peace officer. She was convicted and sentenced to three years probation, which in which she served 20 days of county jail. Her seventh and final conviction was for felony offering false information and evidence in violation of California Penal Code Section 132 in December of 2009, whereby petitioner submitted false insurance forms to the Superior Court of California, falsely showing petitioner had car insurance during a period of time when her car was not insured. This felony conviction resulted in the court placing petitioner on formal felony probation for a period of three years, during which she, she served 30 days in county jail, as well as other terms and conditions. The statement of issues proceeded to a hearing conducted on July 9th, 2018, and concluded with a proposed decision on August 8th, 2018. On or about November 16th, 2018, the board issued an order rejecting the proposed decision. After reviewing transcripts of the hearing and submitted written briefs by the parties, the board issued a decision after non-adoption on February 22nd, 2019, which became effective March 24th, 2019. Pursuant to that decision, petitioner's psychological assistant registration application was granted upon successful completion of all registration requirements within two years and subsequent thereupon her registration was revoked and stayed for a period of five years of probation and she was ordered to undergo psychological evaluation and testing, submit to the supervision of practice monitor, undergo weekly psychotherapy, yearly ethics coursework, quarterly reports, probation costs, and other terms and conditions. As previously stated, the effective date of the board's decision and order was March 24th, 2019 at which time probation was immediately told for a period of seven months until October 30th, 2019. Completion of the five-year probationary period will occur uh -oh. Sorry, will occur on October 31st, 2024. My apologies. Mr. Lent, thank you for that background. Um, I'm now addressing Dr. Horton. Please unmute your mic microphone if you haven't yet done so. Hi. Okay, <laughs> Dr. Horton, I'd like to first administer an oath to you. Please raise your right hand. Okay. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to provide will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, I know that you sat patiently and heard uh, the recitation of this history. Uh, the board, I'm going to remind you again, uh, is concerned more about rehabilitation since the discipline was imposed on your license and not a rehash of matters that happened um, some time ago. And I again want to remind you that the board does have in front of each member the petition package, so you don't have to repeat everything in there, but rather just highlight those matters you think are important for the board's consideration. At this time, uh, take your time, please, and just go through um, <clears throat> all the matters that you wish the board to consider, and then we'll go with questioning after that. Proceed, please. Okay, thank you. Um, I have to start off by saying that um, I am a little nervous, um, so if I, I trip over my words or something, even though I can't see you all, I don't know. I'm just a little nervous. Um, since uh, being placed on probation, um, I have had um, another um, 
therapist uh, from the um, assessment that uh, you guys uh, said that I had to engage in um, to deem that I am safe to practice, um, that I'm not a threat uh, to work with this population. Um, I have taken um, a couple of um, ethics courses um, to uh, stay on top of the current laws and um, to help me in my practice. Um, I'm also uh, fully licensed with the Board of Behavioral Science and I have been licensed for over two years and I have a small part-time practice where um, I'm seeing patients independently uh, and have been uh, doing so um, for over the past year. Um, being able to uh, attend therapy has uh, provided me with the space to discuss um, any stressors uh, because that's the main concern at this point being a single parent and having to juggle uh, so much on top of um, so much with work, so much with uh, being a psych assistant and following uh, the rules and guidelines, having to pay fees and things like that um, is, is kind of added to my stressors and I'm able to process that um, with my therapist um, as far as rehabilitation goes, um, when I was placed on probation, I had already been rehabilitated. Um, I had to be placed on probation with the Board of Behavioral Science. I attended therapy at that time uh, for over two years. So I had plenty of time to process my decision making uh, from when I was younger. Um, it was a lot of different variables at that time, and I won't go into it because, um, as the uh, judge stated, um, I'm sure you all have that in front of you. Um, my uh, feelings are still the same. I love working with the population uh, that I work with. Um, now I, I truly do understand um, how my decisions can not only affect uh, my patients, but myself, my family, um, and my patients do rely on me. Um, I have a very important role and I take that role uh, seriously. Um, I'm blessed to be able to be a beacon of help and hope for others. And um, if I make the wrong decision, that could affect them. And I most definitely would not want to be a part of uh, hurting any of my patients. Um, the last uh, criminal conviction was over 12 years ago. And, um, you know, just to bypass any issues, I just followed the law. You know, simply I'll do what's right, do the right thing. Um, <laughs> I don't really know what else to um, to add at this point. I was planning uh, to read uh, from from what I um, from what I provided, uh, but as the uh, judge shared, you know, it's no need to do that. So um, I'm just grateful uh, that I. I have had the opportunity to get my psych assistant uh, so that um, I could continue uh, to provide psychological services um, as a, a psych assistant planning to become a licensed psychologist, you know, so I could continue to help um, at that capacity. Thank you, Dr. Horton. I think you're going to find once the um, board members and Mr. Lent ask questions that other information will also come out. Okay. I'm going to ask um, Mr. Lent right now to ask questions that he might have. Thank you, Honor. Good morning, Dr. Horton. Good morning. You just mentioned that uh, you were or are licensed uh, for over two years with the California Board of Behavioral Sciences. Um, is it correct to say that 
back in 2012, you initially applied for your license as a associate clinical uh, social worker with the BBS, but it was initially denied. And then subsequently the following year in 2013, it was issued with probationary terms and conditions. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. Is it also accurate that during that time of probation in 2015, uh, you were actually in violation of the terms in which you stopped going to psychotherapy and you were delinquent in submitting quarterly reports for a period of time? Is that accurate? Um, it's not accurate. It is accurate, but it's not accurate. Um, was well, accurate with the explanation. Is that is that a valid uh, re response? Well, let me ask you this clarification. Is it yes. accurate? Uh, and, and you can give give us your explanation uh, okay. afterwards. I just want to make sure I'm accurate. Is it yes. accurate to say that that uh, in 2015, after you were put on probation in that year, uh, you were found in violation of that probation for failing to continue your ongoing psychotherapy sessions and you were also delinquent in submitting quarterly reports which caused your probationary period to be told first tell me that's, if that's, that's accurate no that's not accurate no that's not accurate okay do you have the exhibits uh, that were submitted in this matter at your uh ready to look at right now yes i do okay dr horton if i could have you the board members and uh your honor, directed to exhibit number one, AGO page 16, paragraph 12, please. Okay. GO 16, is it AGO 2? Oh, 16, okay. 16. And just let me know when you're there. I'm here. Okay. We're looking at paragraph number 12. Okay. Just read it silently to yourself. Okay. No, th that's not. Okay. Is it your position that that is inaccurate? Yes, it's inaccurate the way that you have uh, worded bec worded it because um, I told my pro probation I did that because I had a high risk pregnancy, and it was my understanding at that time because I had the probation told that I didn't have to turn in quarterly reports and I didn't have to attend therapy. That was my understanding uh, because I didn't get the clarification from uh, my probation monitor, but no, the board did not tell my probation. I did, I made that request. And so after I made that request, because I was dealing with the high risk pregnancy of my uh, seven year old son, um, I had stopped turning in the reports because I thought that I, I didn't think that I needed to turn them in. And I thought that because it was told that I didn't have to attend therapy at that time. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Uh, going and looking at your uh, petition in this matter, uh, on that petition uh, form, which is located uh, Exhibit 2, AGO page 27. Okay. And I'll let you get there so that we can all be on the same page. Okay. Let me know when you're there. Exhibit 2, AGO 27. Okay, yes. Okay. Under paragraph 5, titled Employment History, which is located on AGO page 29. Okay. It asks you about your past employment for a period of five years. Uh, yeah. And you've listed uh, a single employer employment dating back to November of 2018. Um, yes. Were you employed prior to that any time between 2016 or 2018? Uh, yes, I was. Okay. Is there a reason why you chose not to list that in this employment history? Uh, because I was doing hospice social work and I didn't think that it was relevant uh, to this. I thought that I only needed to list employment that was relevant towards my psych assistant. Okay. 
Could you tell us what period of time you were employed with the hospice care and just a general description of what that entailed and where that occurred? Yes, give me a second. Let me, uh, I need to pull up my, um, my CV, <laughs> sorry. Okay, from what year to what year? That's my question. Uh, the employment history asks you to go back five years. And so I wanted to know prior to 2018, if you were employed anywhere, where would that be? What time period was it and what that employment encompassed? Okay, you only need five. Okay, five years from what date? Because I could provide you with multiple ones from September uh, 2016 um off and on until next last year i was um i was employed by nova hospice located in upland california as a per diem medical social worker um i conducted psychosocial assessments uh bereavement counseling to individuals and families as well as um wait bereavement counseling okay i wrote psychosocial assessments twice on here uh, provided linkages, assisted with Medi-Cal, Social Security, SSI, IHSS, access transportation services and other applications, uh, participated in weekly interdisciplinary uh, team meetings to discuss uh, patient care. And uh, what years did that transpire in? I apologize. Uh, from September 2016, off and on until last year, 2021. When you say off and on, uh, how frequently were you doing that? Um, oh if you could God. estimate. It was sporadic. Uh, I would like, I would stop, like when my father passed away, I stopped for probably like a year because I couldn't handle it. Um, when did that when did that year occur? Shoot, that was probably like in 2017. I don't I don't know. I don't okay. want to because I just took an oath. So I'm not trying to give no misleading or false statements. So I don't know the exact dates. OK, I appreciate your estimation. Um, let me ask you, moving on to your uh, petition, I'm yes. looking at page AGO 30. Yes. And it's paragraph eight titled Petition Forms and Attachments. Do you see where I'm looking? Okay, wait, give me a second so I could get there. Okay, where where are you saying go to? Paragraph eight titled Petition Forms and Attachments on AGO page 30. Is that on exhibit two? Yes. You were still we're still on exhibit two in your petition. Okay, yes. Okay. Do you see where I'm referring to you at? Yes. Right underneath there is subsection A, which says in a detailed narrative statement, address this question. Why do you feel your petition should be granted? Do you see that? Yes. I was reviewing the documents that you submitted in this matter in, in reference to your petition and supporting documents, and I could not locate anything that was identified as attachment A or any letter from you addressing this question specifically? Is, is there a reason why you chose not to include a, a detailed narrative statement addressing this question? It was my impression that my uh, statement was within the questions that I was at answering because I did um, address that. When you say within the questions that you were answering, are you referring to the balance of your petition and the documents yes. you submitted? Okay. AGO 31, AGO 32, AGO 33. Okay. And AGO 31, 32, and 33 are each marked as their own individual attachments in the top right corner of each one, right? AGO yes. 33 is attachment D, that's your therapy information sheet. Yeah. AGO 32 is attachment C. Wait, my bad. Is AGO, give me one moment. AGO uh, 31 and AGO 32. Okay. And AGO 32, just 
for the record is attachment C, evidence of rehabilitation information sheet, and yeah. AG of 31 is attachment B, disciplinary action information sheet, correct? Yes. Okay. So in a follow-up question, because if you look on AGO page 30, under that subsection, under the section 8 for petition form and attachments, it lists attachments A, B, C, D, E, and F, and they identify B as disciplinary action, C as evidence of rehabilitation sheet, and so forth. So yeah. I guess my follow-up question is, because each of these are identified as separate forms and attachments, why is it that you chose not to include a specific attachment A or a letter addressing attachment A rather than uh, simply filing B, C, and D and so forth? Well, it was because I really didn't know that I had to um, list like different attachments. It was my understanding that I just needed to fill out the paperwork um, that was listed in here uh, based off of when I uh, did my petition for for the Board of Behavioral Science. Okay. So I'm not an attorney. I don't really, you know, I don't have a lot of experience with this. All right. I understand. Uh, let's move on to attachment B, which is AGO page 31 in Exhibit 2 that we've uh, just touched upon briefly, and I, I want to ask you a couple follow-up questions in regards to that specific yeah. attachment. Mm -hmm. A question one on that page asks you to describe the events that led to your discipline, and at the top of the page it advises you that you can use additional paper for your answer if you need to. Right. And when you answered that question on that page, you wrote two sentences stating, quote, I had criminal convictions that caused my application to be denied and for my licensure to be revoked. The criminal convictions occurred prior to me applying for my license. Right. So my, my question in response to your answer to that question is, is, is there a reason why you chose not to elaborate further in regards to answering this question? Because the board already has all that information. I've already provided um, details. Um, in regards to this to the board. Okay. So, I, I mean. The question also asks you to describe the events that led to your discipline. And yeah. I'm curious why you refer to the description of the events as the criminal convictions rather than the underlying misconduct that took place. Well, uh, because you guys have the underlying uh, misconduct, you guys have the, the exact details of what happened it's already on record so it's okay. not hiding anything um it's there <laughs> it's it's all uh, there well let me ask you this then if, if your rationale for putting that answer there is because everything is already within the record and everyone knows yeah why did you feel the need to write the second sentence that the criminal convictions occurred prior to your license application uh because it's true. It's true. They did. Okay. All right. Uh, the second question on that same page asks about life stressors that contributed to your actions and asks you about your support system. Uh, yes. And in response to that question, you wrote, uh, I was a single parent without any financial support, and this led to me committing past crimes. So. In 1997, you were convicted of the theft and the fraudulent uh, use of a credit card, and you were 22 years old when that occurred. Is that correct? True, yes. And your last conviction was in 2009 for the felony offering false evidence, and you were 34 years old when that took place? Yes. And, and just to clarify, the way that you answered that question, you attribute your past criminal conduct out of a necessity to support your family. Is that accurate? Yes. You also state that your current support system consists of your two adult daughters and your current boyfriend. Is that accurate? Yes. May I inquire how old each of your daughters are? Uh, yes, they are uh, 25 and 27 years old. Do they reside with you or close to you? Uh, one of them resides with me and one of them resides around the corner. 
Okay. In response to the same question, you also stated that you're aware of different organizations that can provide financial and food support if needed. Could you elaborate on that and provide a few specific examples? Sure. Um, so when I was younger, and because uh, this, the, my my thought, my my mindset when I was answering this question uh, was based off of the petty thefts, all of the thefts that occurred. Uh, when I was younger. Um, at that time, I wasn't aware of the different support systems. I received welfare, I received food stamps, and that's all that I knew of. Um, at this time, after working uh, in social work for so long, I'm fully aware of different organizations, different churches like Catholic Charities, Red Cross, um, even within the welfare department, uh, how social workers can help you. Um, I'm also aware of 211 online, where uh, if whatever services you need, whether it's rental assistance, bill assistance, um, I'm able to go on there and just put it in there if I need those uh, services. But I am blessed at this point where I, I don't. I'm, not in the same place that I was back then. And you did bring up uh, the last conviction that occurred in 2009. Um, my judgment was off at that time. My brother uh, was killed uh, on the freeway and you know, I just, I made a poor judgment call. And I when, don't think that grief played a big part in that. When was the last time you checked to verify that these services were still available to you? Uh, last year, last okay. year for patients, not for me, but for patients. And if it's available for them, it's definitely available for myself. Okay. Uh, turning to the third question on the same uh, sheet that we're on, the disciplinary action information sheet attachment B, uh, it asks whether your behavior that led to your license uh, being disciplined and next to the question are two boxes labeled yes and no. Uh, mm -hmm. it, is there a reason why you didn't check either one of those boxes? Uh, it could have just been an oversight. Okay. In uh, looking at that now, which box would you check? Your behavior that led to yes. And in response, you say, I take full responsibility for my past criminal convictions. So my follow-up question to that is, just as you described it in your answer to the question one on the same page, you characterize your discipline and past behavior in terms of the end result, the criminal convictions, rather than the underlying misconduct. Is there a reason why that is your focus? Well, um, honestly, just to answer the question, because um, when I when I prepared this document, um, I did it under the knowledge that the board already has all of this information, and it's just a formality for me to fill it out and turn it in. Um, I've went over. Uh, all of my criminal convictions in detail um, in the case, uh, in the administrative uh, hearing that I attended, and also in the uh, correspondences uh, that I had to send back to the board. So, so let me let me ask you this then, based on your response just now. So yes. is it your impression that your petition for early termination of probation and all of the uh, attachments that accompany it that we've been discussing, the disciplinary action sheet, the one that we're going to be discussing, your evidence of rehabilitation information sheet, your therapy information, all of those you believe are just formalities and that brevity and your answers are just cursory. Is that your understanding? 
it's it is my understanding that um the questions certain questions that you all ask are uh formalities yes especially when it's described the events that led to your discipline i had to attend a administrative hearing where i had to testify about my criminal convictions um when the board made their decision they went over the transcripts and also uh all of the documentation that i turned in so i figured it's there you know well let me ask you this you looked at all of the exhibits uh back in december correct when they were sent to you um i i skimmed through them I skimmed okay. through them. I downloaded them and I skimmed through them. I did not read them in details. No, I did not. Okay. And when you skimmed through the exhibits in December of 2021 in preparation for your petition hearing today, did you notice in any of the exhibits a transcript of your original hearing of your testimony or any uh, specific documents that you had submitted in the actual hearing that were encompassed within the exhibits for your petition? Uh, no, but uh, when they uh, did the decision to non-adopt, I think that I did read somewhere in there back then that they had um, accessed the uh, transcripts from the petition, from the okay. administrative hearing. I understand that. My question is, is did you see any of those transcripts in the exhibits? No, that were I, for this petition? Okay. honestly, I don't remember what was in it. Um, if you could remember when you sent me the email in regards to the exhibits, um, initially I attempted to pull them up because I didn't even remember that I had downloaded and saved them. And then I sent the follow up email to you and I had requested uh, for you to send them again. And then I said, let me check and see if I downloaded them because I'm sure I did. And so I did, I had downloaded the redacted and the unredacted uh, documents and I looked through them. So, um, no, I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember every document that was uh, attached to it either. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on to question number six, we're still on uh, your attachment B, Disciplinary Action Information Sheet, AGO, page 31. Do you see question six there? Yes. And it asks uh, how you believe your actions or issues which led to your discipline have affected patients and or their families. And in response, you wrote, uh, I would have went to jail and it would have left them without services. Yes. So besides inconveniencing your patients without having services. Can you elaborate as to other possible ramifications that your patients and their families would have endured? Well, when you say without services, it's more than just an inconvenience because uh, I have patients who are suicidal and I'm the one who is there um, to help them uh, by providing them with the coping skills um, and ensuring that they're practicing these coping skills to prevent themselves from killing themselves. I have patients who have eating disorders. Um, and the reason why they're not in the hospital is because of their weekly or uh, two times per week uh, meetings with me. So it's a lot more than just inconveniencing people that, that you know, I'm important to a lot of people. Like my role is is very, uh, very important. You know? And Dr. Horton, you can uh -huh. see why I asked you to elaborate on that because your answer just simply says without services. And so I, I wanna give you an opportunity to elaborate as to the significance of your statement and inquire yeah. as to why you didn't put further detail or descriptions in your answers in your petition to that effect. Like those are the answers the board wants to hear those are things that we want to inquire into you. And my question is, if those things are so vital and important, why did you feel the need not to put them within your petition? Well, honestly, I, I was not thinking um, at that level. 
just to be honest, I didn't think that, um, I figured, you know, if you needed to ask me any other questions, you could do it during, uh, the, like you, like you just did a minute ago, you know, so I'm not sure. Okay. And when I turned it in, you know, I, I figured, uh, the probation monitor will say, well, you know, you should provide more information. So I didn't think that uh, me providing shorter answers would be on trial <laughs> because, like I said, when I did my um, the petition for um, excuse me, my petition for modification of uh, penalty early termination with the Board of Behavioral Science, I provided a shorter, uh, you know, short answers. And so during that hearing, they did elaborate on the the sections that they needed to, just like you just did right now for number six. Well, Dr. Horton, you realize because this is your petition, the burden is on you to demonstrate rehabilitation. It, it's not the burden of the board or the burden of the attorney general's office to elicit elaborated information from you rather that's your burden it's your petition to get off probation early do you understand that well of course i do absolutely but my i'm answering the questions i did provide answers to the questions so um like in number six my past actions would have impacted my clients okay. you know because i would have went to jail and it would have left them without any services in addition to leaving them without services if your patients who as you say rely on you and obviously would have a deep-seated uh trust trustful relationship with you and yes. rely on you for their mental health mm -hmm. if they were to discover uh your criminal history of crimes and moral turpitude how do you think that that would impact their ability to trust you in future sessions um you mean the past what i have uh done in the past or like if I were to want like can you reword that question so I could understand exactly what you sure mean? the the question that was asked to you is you know how you think your actions or inactions have affected patients and family members and so the question is is that you know have if your patients, yeah have, have oh yeah, that have, it, it would has, impact Mr. No. Lind Mr. Lind I'm going to pose an objection. I think it calls for speculation and yeah. ask you to either read some question or move on to another area. Okay. The question uh, Dr. Horton asks you, how do you think your actions or inactions or issues that led to your discipline have affected patients or their family members? And the question I have for you is if your patients were to learn about these types of criminal histories, do you think that that would impact their ability to trust you? Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. And uh, all of my information is public records. And so a lot of my patients uh, do research me, you know, I mean, with my practice. Uh, because remember, I have an independent, uh, small part time practice. They do research me prior to. And okay. so uh, when I'm treating uh, my adolescent patients, I actually do disclose uh, my past as a beacon of hope for them. So no, absolutely not. And the reason why I answered that question in the way that I did is because I don't have any present criminal convictions. I didn't, um, I did not get convicted for any crimes as a therapist or anywhere in this role. Understood. Moving on to question seven on the same sheet, it asks you how you would handle the same situations that led to your discipline if they occurred today. Yes. And your response was to seek out donations, charities, and ask for uh, help from your family members. Is that accurate? Yes. How would seeking out the assistance of charities or asking your family for help assist you if a similar situation that you were in in 2003 where you made false representations of identity to a peace officer assist you? 
Well, the reason why I made that, uh, why I lied about my name to the police officer was because I had warrants for traffic citations because I didn't have the money to pay for it. So many of my crimes, even the one um, around the time that my brother passed away um, was because I just didn't have money. And so now I'm a completely a uh, different person and um, I definitely uh, think about consequences and I'm aware of other resources. So I would uh, be able to make a request uh, to get help, you know, and um, like I just shared earlier, my daughters are young adults. Uh, my oldest daughter is a school teacher. She has her master's in education. She's tenured on her job. She earns good money. She has a tutoring business on the side. Uh, my youngest daughter uh, works for Amazon. She does overtime a lot. Um, she also uh, does Uber Eats uh, while she's uh, waiting to get into nursing school. The point is, if I need money, I could go to them, you know, or even my boyfriend. I didn't have all the supports back then. Dr. Horton, if I can ask a follow-up then, what if yes. your family members that you turn to for support are indifferent to your situation or advise you that you should do something unethical or criminal like your aunt and your mother did in your past? Right, we are talking about different characters, right? So my mother is a crack addict and she has been, well, she's clean now. She's been clean for maybe a year or two, but my mom was a crack addict from uh, when I was in the second grade up until a year or two, what, 44 years old, uh, second grade, that's about eight. So from about age eight to 44, my mom was addicted to crack. Uh, my aunt wasn't the best person, as you could see, because, you know, the whole thing with the credit card statement, my daughters are not like that. Uh, my daughters, neither one of them have ever committed any crimes. Um, as I just shared, my daughter, my oldest daughter is a, a, a tenured special education teacher. Um, and my youngest daughter is uh, going into nursing. Neither one of them have ever committed a crime. So they would not make that type of suggestion. And I'll go along with your suggestion or, you know, play the devil's advocate. Let's say if someone were to come to me and say, you know, um, do whatever you know, that's illegal. Um, I use my own judgment and I wouldn't do it, period. I've already had that experience and learned from it. So it doesn't matter if someone suggested. Okay, thank you, Dr. Horton. I wanna direct your attention to the next attachment. It's attachment C. Evidence of Rehabilitation Information Sheet. It's AGO page 32. Are you there? Yeah. Uh-huh. So looking at question one, which asks uh, about your coursework in the same area pertaining to your underlying conduct of your discipline, and yes. your response was that you took law and ethics. Are, are you referring to the January 2020 Chicago School of Professional Psychology course? Um, that one, and also I took law and ethics um, as a PsyD student, and I also did um, law and ethics uh, for the Board of Behavioral Science. So I'm talking about all of those. Okay. And were those courses uh, required terms of your condition of probation, your courseworks? Um, I was off probation at that time. So uh, one of them the one for my PsyD that was in relation to um, me getting my PsyD. Um, the other one, um, law and ethics, was uh, in relation to me having to pass the law and ethics test to get licensed as a social worker because I'm currently an LCSW. And then the other one was in connection to 
uh, probation. That one was in connection to probation with the Board of, Board of uh, Psychology. So besides those courses you've just identified, yes. uh, are there any other courseworks that you've completed that pertain to the conduct that led to your discipline? Um, no, mm -mm, just those. That's that's a lot. And I've, I've taken some recently. I had to take one, um, well, two of them, actually three. I just finished one a week ago. Um, I had to take two of them in connection to this probation last year okay. at the end of the year. Question two on the same page asks you if you sought out therapy regarding the conduct that led to your discipline. And yes. you indicated that you did seek out therapy, correct? Yes. And psychotherapy, that's a required term of your probation in this matter, isn't that correct? Yes, it is. And as a requirement uh, of the decision and order, you were required to attend at a minimum one hour per week for a minimum of 52 consecutive weeks. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, if I could just briefly skip and turn to your therapy information sheet, it's AGO page 33, the following page. Yes. Paragraph uh, two or question two uh, asked uh, your therapist how often and how long you meet, and it indicates weekly 45 to 60 minutes per session. Is that correct? Yes. Do you know how many of your therapy sessions were less than the required one hour? Uh, no. Mm -mm. Do you, did any of your sessions run less than 45 minutes in length? Um, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't think so, I'm not sure. Did uh, you fail to appear or fail to show for any of your therapy sessions? Um, I could have. I don't think so. I'm not sure. I could have. Okay. Because we were dealing with COVID uh, last year and just recently uh, with this new variant. So I'm not sure. Okay. If I could direct your attention, the board's attention, and your honor's attention to exhibit four, we could go to exhibit four, please, uh, beginning with page uh, AGO 118. Just let me know when you're there. Okay. Okay. So from pages 118 to 150, it documents your therapy sessions. If you could just uh, skim through those very briefly and verify that. Yes. And Dr. Horton, just let me know when you're done skimming through those. I'm done. Okay. So those um, quarterly progress notes from your therapist uh, occur between, uh, or rather document your therapy sessions from January 2022 up until September of 2021. Is that accurate? Uh, yes. Okay. So in reviewing those, I counted 48, uh, sorry, 64 sessions total that are documented there. Uh, there is a portion that's missing that wasn't submitted. 
but of the ones that are documented, 64 sessions are documented in there. And in each documentation, there is a bold faced uh, heading titled session number, date of session, and length of session. Do you see that on every other page, give or take? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. okay. And each of those uh, notations document when your session took place, how long the session lasted, and if, in fact, you did not appear or show for a session. Do you see those? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in reviewing those 64 therapy sessions uh, between January 2020 and September 2021, um, I counted a total of 10 therapy sessions where you did not appear or failed to show. Does that appear to be accurate based on your review of those? Uh, probably so. I did see a few no-shows, yes. Okay. And there's quite a few that are less than 60 minutes in length. Did you also notice that? Um, I didn't notice quite a few, but I did notice a couple of them, yes. Okay. In reviewing those uh, quarterly progress notes, is it surprising to you that roughly 48 of the 64 sessions or 75% of the sessions were less than 60 minutes? Um, you said 75 out of... No, I said I said 48 sessions out of the 64 that are documented, which is 75% of those documented sessions are less than 60 minutes in length. Is okay. that surprising to you? Uh, no, it's not. No, because okay. I think the sessions are supposed to be 45 minutes to 60, right? Well, let's go back for a second. Give me mm -hmm. one moment. Let's go to exhibit one. Mm hmm AGO page 22. Okay. Wait a minute. Exhibit one? Exhibit one, mm -hmm. AGO page 22. Okay, yes. Okay, do you see it? Yes, I do. Okay. And under paragraph Three, it's titled psychotherapy. This is part of the uh, order and decision in your matter. Mm -hmm. And within that paragraph, it details uh, right in the center there under subsection three, the following uh, two sentences. Psychotherapy shall at a minimum consist of one hour per week over a period of 52 consecutive weeks. Do you see that? I do. Okay, is there any indication in there that the therapy session should be less than one hour? Uh, no, it's not, mm -mm, not there. In fact, it says at a minimum, it should consist of one hour, correct? Yes, uh -huh, it does. Okay. When you were previously on probation with the California Board of Behavioral Sciences, uh, you were also attending therapy as a term of probation there between roughly 2014 and 2017. Is that accurate? Yes. Mm -hmm. And when you were addressing the board during your hearings uh, for this matter back in 2019, you had indicated to the board that you had no plans to continue therapy after your probation had concluded in the uh, behavioral sciences matter. Is that correct? True. Yeah. And you stated earlier this morning that um, you believe prior to probation in this matter, you considered yourself already rehabilitated. Is that still accurate? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. So may I inquire, after being ordered to attend therapy twice by two different licensing boards, do you still plan on continuing to attend therapy? Uh, this time, yes. I do. I found a wonderful therapist. I love Dr. Sue. Um, I won't be attending it uh, as much. I'll more than likely be attending it uh, once a month or once, you know, every other month, but I'm definitely going to continue. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said, I do have um, a lot. I have a lot more different uh, type of stress. Uh, now because I have a private practice and, um, you know, trying to juggle everything. It's just, you know. I understand. 
yeah, but not in relation to uh, committing crimes or anything like that. That's that's um, over that. Okay. As a term and condition of your probation in this matter, you are also required to undergo a psychological evaluation. Is that correct? Yes. And that occurred in November of 2019 with uh, Dr. Thompson. Is that accurate? Yes. And Dr. Thompson's uh, psychological evaluation report is part of Exhibit 4. It's AGO pages 104 to 116. Have you had an opportunity to review that report? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. If you could turn to Exhibit 4, AGO pages 104 to 116, and uh, review that silently and let me know when you're complete. Okay. Thank you. One oh four to one sixteen. Yes. Um, do you want me to look for anything in particular? Well, my question would be, have you seen or reviewed that evaluation report prior to me just asking you that? Oh, no, I haven't, but I, I just skimmed through it. Okay. When the exhibits were sent to you again in December of 2021, and then uh, you looked at them again in January of 2022 in preparation for your hearing today, that was included within the exhibits, was it not? I didn't remember. I didn't. I had shared with you that I skimmed. Like I didn't skim through each exhibit uh, tab. I just like kind of looked at it, skimmed through maybe one of them to see what it was and closed it. But okay. now I did just skim through, you know, skim through it and uh, saw this. Well, let me direct your attention then to AGO page. Uh, 112, that's the evaluation report. Okay, yeah, I'm on it, I'm with, on 16, uh-huh. Beginning with assessment findings. Yes. If, if I could have you review that and the following uh, pages, the findings and opinions of Dr. Thomas, uh, I'll have a follow-up question or two in reference to it. So just review those and let me know when you're done with those pages. You want me to read the entire uh, AGO 112? Well, my question to you is, do you agree with Dr. Tom Thomas's findings and opinions contained within that report? Um, I don't agree with having lack of insight on uh, this makes prognosis for any form of intervention poor because of lack of insight. Um, I don't agree with, with that. I have a lot of insight on myself. Is that uh, if you continue to look through those uh, assessments, the opinions and findings, do you find any other assertions or conclusions that Dr. Thomas made that you can test other than uh, lack of insight? Um, for self-representation, to reflect the background of stressing traditional values or in addition. I said this. 
Elevations in the south. So much kill. Oh yeah. Uh huh. I read. I I read through it. Okay. Do you contest any other opinions or assessments that uh, Dr. Thomas made, other than the uh, uh, lack of insight? Um. No. I okay. don't. This is right. what she this is what she came up with uh you know based off of her scoring. Um you when you were um on probation with the uh, BBS, you were your probation was told for a period of time. And then in this instance, your probation was also told for a period of time. Is that accurate? Yes. Yes. And mm -hmm. so and so you were only on active probation in this matter for approximately one year and five months because your probation was told for seven months. Is that accurate? I'm not sure. I haven't done the math. Does that sound to be approximately accurate? I mean, I don't want to have you commit precisely, but uh, does that sound approximately no. correct? No, I think it's longer than that. You think that your uh, probation was told in a longer period than seven months? No, I think I've been actually on active probation longer than a year and five months. Okay. How long do you think? Well, let me clarify that. Prior to you filing the petition in this case, how long do you think you were on active probation? Um, I'm not sure, but I, like I said, I think that I've been on probation longer than a year and five months. Okay. How long was your probation told in this matter? Or what's your understanding of how long your probation was told in this matter? Uh, you just said seven months. Okay. And probation became effective on, uh, let me find the date, March 24th, 2019. Is that correct? Yep. I guess. And you filed, and you filed your petition on March 24th, 2021. Is that correct? I did. No, 2021? Yeah. When oh, you filed yeah, yeah, your yeah. I did. I got confused. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's okay. So <laughs> you would agree with me that probation was effective March 24th, 2019, and you filed your petition March 24th, 2021. That's two years, correct? Yeah. And your probation was told up for until seven yeah. for seven months. So you were on active probation for approximately one year and five months before you filed your petition. Is that accurate? Um, I guess if you did the math. I didn't do the math. Does that sound accurate? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not going to say yes or no to that because I okay. didn't do the math. That that's fair. So my question to you is: Why is it you believe you should be granted early termination of your probation when you've only been on active probation for less than two years from the time in which you started to the time at which you filed your petition in this matter um i'm not sure uh let me let me do the math uh before i answer this because i like to be precise give me a second sure
still there, Dr. Harden? I am. I'm I'm reading, remember? Okay. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to get to the uh the actual dates so that I could see them for myself. So, um, give me a moment. Oh, that's this one. So, um, if the pro okay so the probation was initially um started as of march 24 2019 right so you said it was told for seven months march april may june july September, october so from october 2019 to october 2021 that's two years and um, so it's actually been two years and a couple months. It hasn't been a year and five months. Okay, in that time period, uh, why is it you think, uh, you believe you should be granted early termination of your probation? Um, so uh, first, because it has been uh, over two years, not just a year and five months, uh, like you had um, shared a minute ago, um, I've learned my lesson. Uh, the point of me being on probation is to protect the public and uh, to ensure that I'm practicing within safety. I've had two different psychologists, Dr. Sherry Adrian from June 15, 2017 to share that I'm not a threat, uh, that there are no safety issues with me practicing. And also Dr. Veronica Thomas uh, in November of 2019 to also say that I am not a threat uh, to the public. Um, I've learned my lesson from my past uh, poor judgment uh, when I was younger I would never, ever make that type of decision as I shared earlier. I do have a very important role with my patients and I take it uh, seriously. Um, my moral compass is uh, stronger than ever. Not only am I attending therapy for the same exact thing that I attended therapy before when I was on probation, uh, with the Board of Behavioral Science. Um, you know, it's been a while, I'm not sure, because I have not done the math uh, with the time frame and the amount of sessions. But um, in session, I'm mainly discussing my stressors uh, because I don't commit crimes. So, and if you look in, um, the exhibit that, uh, give me a moment, let me pull it up. Curtis Gardner uh, had to turn in. Um, dang, so many different ones. Let's see. Says so treatment. Okay, so if you look at, um, shoot. Give me a moment. So uh, if you look at um, 
the shoot this isn't it well curtis garner turned in an exhibit to state whether or not i'm obeying all laws and uh the different uh things the stipulations if i'm following them um he did share that i was with the exception of not completing a law and ethic course in which i didn't know that i needed to complete it um when i found out that i had to i did it um quickly i think it was within two to th a two to three week time span um and i've also completed uh the one that is for this year so I've shown that um, I'm rehabilitated through those deeds, uh, through following uh, you guys' rules, through following the law, not even getting a traffic citation. Um, I can't even say the last time that I got a traffic citation. Um, and also uh, having a strong moral compass. Uh, those For those reasons, um, I definitely deserve for my probation to be terminated. And not to mention, I am uh, currently a licensed uh, therapist uh, with a small practice and I'm working independently and I haven't had any issues uh, with that board. Um, if you could use that as a model, I'll follow their rules um, and was able to get off of probation early uh, with that board based off of the same reasons for, for following the rules. Dr. Horton, you mentioned something that I want to follow up on just briefly. Um, you indicated that in this particular matter, you had um, violated a term of probation in regards to your yes. coursework. Mm -hmm. um, that was uh, a six hour coursework that was due no later than October 31st of 2021. Yes. And I believe probation monitor Curtis Gardner uh, cited you for a violation notice for that uh, violation of a probation term and condition in December. Yes. And you indicated that uh, after being informed of that violation, you then remedied it by uh, participating in that coursework. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. Yep. That's Your Honor, I have no further questions. Mr. Lynn, thank you very much. Um, addressing Board President Dr. Tate, um, is it the Board's pleasure to push through or would you like to take a short recess before Board members question? You know what, let's let the Board members question. All right, then I'm going to um, go through your names, uh, beginning with you, Dr. Tate, and then uh, alphabetical following um, Board member so, Dr. Tate, go ahead, please. I don't have any further questions at this time. Thank you. All right. Board member Fu, please. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Horton, thank you for making time today. And I'm going to just be fairly brief with my questions um, and some of which you've answered already, but just to pull them out here for um, so that at the top of mind, um, you mentioned that you're currently licensed with the Board of Behavioral Sciences. How long have you been um, holding that license free and clear? Um, I've been holding my license uh, free and clear. Let me let me uh, pull it up so that um, I could be precise. Oh, apologies. My apologies for asking you to do that. Um, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's no worries. It shouldn't take long because you know it's it's the internet, so it's at my fingertips. So I have. Okay, so um, my license was issued uh, March 19 of 2019 and uh, it expires March 31st of 2023. Thank you. And, and since holding that license, have, to your knowledge, have you, um, have you been made aware of any complaints or discipline issued against you for that license? None. Um, 
could you share with us um, just your thoughts on the definition of, of remorse um, and how you meet that definition based on um, what you've shared? Yes, definitely. So uh, for remorse, um, my definition of it is to uh, feel bad um, and uh, for something that you've done wrong um, and to be to hold yourself accountable for it. Um, and I do feel bad for uh, the decisions that I made at that time. Um, I was a different person. Um, I did what I thought that I needed to do for myself and my family, um, you know, um, and didn't, didn't think certain things through, didn't realize, uh, consequences, uh, until, you know, I, I experienced it. Um, and so I definitely have, uh, a lot of remorse. Uh, for what I did. Um, if it were just me, then maybe it wouldn't matter, but it was my daughters involved at that time. I was not a professional. I didn't, you know, hold um, the, the high position that I have at this time. But uh, going to jail and leaving my daughters uh, at that time, you know, I definitely have a lot of remorse for it. Um, I would never ever do anything like that uh, now. So, you know, I can't um, include my patients uh, in that, you know, explanation. But what I would say is I would not ever make that type of decision because I wouldn't want to let my patients down. They do rely on me. Thank you, Dr. Horton. I appreciate you sharing your responses. Um, no further questions from me, Your Honor. Thank you, Board Member Fu. And now, uh, Dr. Kasuga, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Honor. Um, Dr. Horton, um, I just have a follow-up question with regards um, your answers on um, the form given that we didn't get like the detailed narrative statement um nice. how have you um benefited from being on probation um for the um the time that you've um you've uh, been actively on probation uh the the biggest benefit of me being the is a couple of them so uh the the main biggest benefit of me being on probation is being able to attend therapy um, and to have that safe space uh, to be able to um, refine the coping skills that I have um, and uh, to be able to get a different outlook uh, regarding different stressors. Um, the other uh, benefit uh, is actually attending the um, law and ethics courses, you know, especially uh, the ones that Curtis, uh, Mr. Gardner, told me about through TZK. They have been uh, really informative uh, regarding like teletherapy and stuff like that, uh, topics like that. So those those have been the uh, the biggest benefits. What do you think would be the biggest um, change with regards to your practice um, and benefit for you to have um, the your petition for early termination granted? Well, it will be sort of a graduation um, to solidify that um, I am rehabilitated and, uh, you know, I am um, able to uh, practice uh, safely without having that extra uh, safeguard uh, based on the fact that um, I am a licensed uh, provider as I shared before. So, um, you know, to just be like, okay, I gained the board's trust. 
Thank you so much for, for your answers. I have no further question. Thank you, Dr. Kasuga. Dr. Cervantes? I have no questions at this time. Thank you for being with us, Dr. Horton. You're welcome. Then uh, thank you, Dr. Sheets. Uh, thank you, Dr. Horton, for being forthcoming with us. Um, my question is about insight, and you had indicated to us that you didn't agree with the findings by Dr. Thomas uh, about a some limited insight on your part. So I wonder if you could share with us a little bit more how you see yourself using insight in your uh, life today, personally and professionally? Yes, yes. Um, so um, having insight on uh, my personal limitations, where I need to uh, create boundary, boundaries uh, when I'm overwhelmed, um, knowing how to um, take time off for self-care. Um, in regards to um, my past when I was younger, uh, I made a lot of poor decisions. Um, I have that insight for sure uh, that I have had poor judgment, you know, in the past. So uh, for me, I can't, I don't make any uh, impulsive uh, decisions, you know, uh, having that insight on myself, you know, to re do a little bit more research, uh, especially uh, when I'm, when it comes down to uh, treating my patients. Um, and also uh, making sure that I am taken care of. Um, uh -huh. Okay, I, I had one more question. Um, when you, uh, several times you had mentioned in response to Mr. Liu's questioning, or Mr. Um, Lent's questioning, about um, you, you didn't think that you needed to, for example, maybe answer the uh, certain questions. And, you know, so often in practice, I'm sure you find in your, uh, your own practice, things come up where we might not be sure of how to respond or what we need to be attending to. So could you share with us when you run into those situations, how do you um, determine what you need to know? What steps do you take? Okay. Um, I'm gonna try to <laughs> I'm gonna try to answer it because it was kind of vague, right? Yeah, um, it, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, in, but in general, what kinds of yeah. stuff, or what do you think might be available to you okay. uh, to ans get some answers to questions? Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, in regards to my petition uh, to the board, um, it's okay. So that's I have to specify this because it's it's very different. Um, and then I'm going to give you another scenario, right? Private practice and as a psych assistant. So um, in regards to my petition uh, to the board, considering my history with the Board of Psychology, I mean, I had to do the initial application where I provided an explanation. I attended an um, administrative hearing that addressed everything that was um, on that petition. Well, most mostly uh, everything that was on that petition. Um, and then you have the actual petition. So it's kind of like uh, a repetition, like you, you repeating uh, everything. So I kind of figured uh, that the information uh, is, is there, is at uh, the board's disposal. So it's just all about me you know, answering the questions, you know, providing um, straightforward and direct answers to the questions. And during this meeting, I, I had the idea if you all needed 
uh, more information, you know, um, you would uh, ask, you would ask me to elaborate. Now, in private practice, I've, I've done it uh, multiple times uh, with uh, patients, uh, with insurance companies. If I have any questions, I'll contact them. I will send an email and, or I will contact uh, provider relations uh, in a heartbeat. Um, in regards to like, let's say if I have a patient who wants me to uh, take them off from work uh, with a temporary disability and they're an EAP patient, um, I had to call in to get clarification on if that's something that I could do with those short-term um, sessions. Um, as a psych assistant, uh, if there's a, a gray area or, you know, an area where I'm confused and I just don't know, uh, then I will consult with uh, Dr. Kaufman, um, my clinical supervisor. And I've also, uh, speaking of consultations, I've also had to consult with colleagues um, about different topics, you know, when treating you know, let's say, you know, LGBTQ, if I have questions, you know, on um, certain things on how to treat them and stuff like that. So I have no problems with uh, reaching out and, and inquiring, you know, asking you. for clarification. That's helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Horton. I have okay. no more questions. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sheets. Board member Nystrom. Hi, uh, Dr. Horton, thank you for your time today and um, answering our questions. And um, I think all of my questions have been answered. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Stephen Phillips. Uh, okay, I'm off mute. Um, I've got so many screens going on between my documents and uh, good morning, uh, Dr. Horton. Good morning. I just wanted to ask you one follow-up question. And that was with res respect to Dr. Thomas's report. Yes. Um, and you said you agreed with the recommendations there, except for her observations about your presence or absence of insight. Right. Okay. I, I might need to. I might need to read over it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me, know, let me, I'm, ner I'm nervous and I, you know, I okay. want to be able to be precise and, and present myself in, in a way that I intend to, but okay, go ahead. Okay, so um, on AGO page 114. Okay, wait, let me, pull it. Let, let me pull it up. Um, sure. Because um, I did a close. I closed it because I had so many exhibits up, I, I start confusing myself. So which exhibit is that? It's, uh, it is part of, let me look here. It's part of exhibit, you wrong. It's AGO 114, it's probably about halfway through the package. Is it? Is it exhibit? Is that exhibit? I think that's exhibit four. Yeah, I think you're right. Exhibit four, your certified probation. Okay, it's on which page? It's on AGO one fourteen. Okay. Wait, I went too far. I'll be giving you one moment. Okay. Um, at line 10, uh, it mm -hmm. says, it is recommended that Dr. Horton remain in psychotherapy for five years with mm -hmm. a time of probation where counter -tra transference and counter transference issues can be thoroughly addressed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, do you disagree with her uh, recommendation that you remain in therapy for five years? Um, absolutely, in connection to uh, probation. Um, <laughs> I don't have, uh, I mean, I could just go based off of my personal, um, experience. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And I don't have any issues with transference or counter transference uh, affected me uh, in my practice. Um, I guess this goes back to uh, the insight uh, question. I mean, that uh, one of the other doctors had posed to me. I don't, I don't remember what the question was and I didn't write it down, but I know it has something to do with insight. And so um, I do use uh, my reactions um, with my patients as a tool um, to help me in therapy. So um, let's say uh, if I have a patient um, who I find to be just so difficult, you know, um, I do sit back and I'll think about it, or if I can't figure it out, I will consult with colleagues regarding that because, you know, my whole goal is to, to help them uh, to overcome whatever issue it is that they're coming to therapy for. So um, I haven't had uh, transference or counter transference uh, to be uh, any issues. Uh, in my practice. It sounds, like, it sounds like there are transference and counter-transference issues that come up, but you feel like you can resolve them? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. In response to uh, a question from Dr. Harp Sheets, you talked about having used poor judgment in the past. Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what, what peace of mind can you give us that you uh, will not exercise poor judgment in the future? Well, um, I'm a lot older. I've been to jail. Um, I have so much to lose and my poor patients, uh, they have so much to lose. I have uh, some patients who are uh, extremely vulnerable and uh, I just wouldn't let, I wouldn't want to let them down. Um, so uh, taking all of uh, what I just shared into consideration, I use that uh, to make judgment calls. You know, um, if it's uh, a, a situation that may be in a gray area, um, then that's when I'll consult. I, 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 I consult, consult a lot, you know, if I need to. So um, just not making impulsive decisions, taking my time and just using um, what I've learned from my past experiences uh, as a guide. Okay, and you put that in a clinical context. What about judgment relative to your own personal life? Um, so it's pretty much the same thing using past my past experiences uh, as a guide, like uh, uh, Mr. Lint, Mr. Lint uh, said earlier, well, what if one of your uh, daughters were to tell you to, you know, do something, I don't know if he said illegal, but that's what it translated to me, um, to do something wrong or illegal, then what would you do? I wouldn't do it. I mean, I'm, I know what the consequence is. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've, I've been, I've been through, you know, like I actually had to live it and I've had to deal with the backlash. Um, even right now today, being in this hearing, uh, from making those poor decisions. So just doing the right thing. Well, thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. Yes. I invite um, board member Riscotti to ask questions if you have any. Hi, Dr. Horton. Thank you for your time today. Um, my question is, have you ever gone to therapy outside of being required, like you decided to go on your own to kind of deal with uh, past traumas? Uh, no, I have not. Mm -mm. Okay, thank you. And would you consider, have you ever considered 
Maybe. Uh, no, no, okay. because I have actually used uh, these therapy sessions, the ones with the Board of uh, Behavioral Science. Mm -hmm. And um, also uh, my current therapy, I use it uh, to deal with past traumas. I've dealt with them. So okay. it, when I, yeah, when I attend therapy, we're not just talking about, you know, um, when I, you know, committed crimes and stuff, we're talking about like my relationships with my family and, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. I use it, um, I've used it and I continue to use it uh, to help myself. And once the requirement for it um, is over, do you see yourself continuing on your own or? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Therapy. Oh, yes. Yes, I do. Not Thank as you. not as often, but yes, I definitely do. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And then finally, Dr. Rogers. Thank you so much, uh, Your Honor. And thank you, Dr. Horton, for being with us today and answering our questions. Um, I do have a couple of questions for you. My first one is related to a statement that you made earlier on in the hearing uh, where you mentioned I've already been rehabilitated and you mentioned that um, much of this took place when you were on probation uh, with the BBS. And so my question for you, it's actually a two-part question. Um, one, what is your definition of being rehabilitated? And then the second part of it is how and when did you know that you had been rehabilitated? Okay. So um, uh, to answer your uh, first question, a definition of uh, being rehabilitated um, is uh, shoot. Let me think on this one. So uh, being a different person, um, not making the same decisions, uh, not wanting to do uh, the same uh, actions as before, um, being uh, healed in a sense, you know, um, being able to use uh, different tools um, for judgment, you know, um, thinking about, uh, you know, uh, different things like consequences uh, for actions and not wanting to do, like I said a second ago, uh, the same exact things, wanting to do different things um, so that, uh, you know, a person could get a different outcome. And just learning uh, from past experiences and using um, those experiences uh, as a guide on how to, you know, live your life, just being a completely different person. I'm not sure um, if I answered your question in regards to the definition of uh, rehabilitation. It, did that suffice? Uh, yes, you? yes, that's helpful. I was really mostly interested in what your definition was. So that was, um, that was really helpful. And so at what point did you realize or feel that you had become rehabilitated during this process? Um, <laughs> throughout this process or throughout the process with the Board of Behavioral Science? Either one or both. Okay, so um, I knew I was rehabilitated from the time that I got off probation uh, from the uh, last crime. Um, in 2009, 2009 um, I knew I didn't want to ever go through anything like that again. Um, it was um, a, a big hardship on my family and um, I, I was embarrassed uh, by it. And um, 
I knew that I had, uh, I was changing my life and going into something different. And so I did not want to uh, jeopardize the population uh, that I was working with. You know, I wanted to be able to be someone who my patients could look up to. So mm -hmm. knowing that um, I was making that change, um, I, de I decided that was it. You know, there's no more uh, making uh, any rash or impulsive decisions, um, even though I was uh, grieving the loss of my brother at that time, you know, um, the decision was more impulsive uh, based off of that. And I guess that's where the insight would uh, would have been really helpful, knowing that I was uh, at that place in grieving uh, the loss of my brother, um, just to take my time and say, like, you know, is this the right thing? You know, just, you know, do the right thing. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of other questions, and you already touched on this um, with this next question I'm going to ask, so it might sound a bit repetitive, but uh, what I have here is what are the lessons that you've learned and the insights that you've gained during this process of being on probation, specifically with the Board of Psychology, and how does that inform your approach to life as well as the work with your clients? Yes. Wait. <laughs> can, can you repeat it? Thoughtfully? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's a two-part question that I put in one, so I'll break it up. Uh, so the first one is, what are the lessons that you've learned during this process of being on probation? So what kinds of insights have you gained along the way? Okay, so um, being on probation just refined the fact that uh, my decisions can not only hurt myself and my family, but the population that I work with and how they do rely on me, how I, I'm important. So um, my lesson, the biggest lesson that I learned is number one, not to, or that that was refined, uh, not to make impulsive decisions, to do the right thing. Um, if there is a gray area, uh, consult. Um, if you know that it's just not right, then steer away from it, you know, and 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 just to, you know, think about the people's lives uh, that that can be affected, you know, uh, including um, my my patients, you know, because mm -hmm. I deal with a very vulnerable population. Okay. And then what was the second part? Well, you actually already touched on that. The second part was how does that inform your approach to life and how does that um, inform the work that you do with your clients? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, let's see, I think I might have one last question. Oh, yes. Um, so you have a private practice right now where you're working with clients. And so I'd like to just uh, get a sense from you if you were treating a client or a patient who presented with the same set of circumstances, uh, mm -hmm. what would your approach be in helping them to navigate through the emotional aspects of a situation like this? Okay. Um, so if I had a pet, I, I, I want to make sure I, under, I understand the question that you just um, asked me. Sure. Um, so if I were to be treating a patient who's on probation or a, a patient who um, has a criminal background, um, like what, like, is it related to the probation or what? Um, you know what? I hadn't uh, specified that when I wrote it out. So I would say if, if you had a client that presented with the same set of circumstances that you're presenting with. So let's say there's a clinician who is on probation for, you know, a number of um, poor choices and convictions and they were trying to get their license back. Um, how would you um, offer care? 
for that particular client? What would be important in your approach with them as you help them navigate through it? Okay, so it will be important for me to provide them with a safe space to be able to openly share how that experience is affecting them. Um, and also uh, with encouraging them just to follow the rules. You know? But I think that providing them with the safe space to be able to you know, share how it's affecting them and to provide them with coping skills to help them to get through it is like the most important um, thing. And I guess to also, it just depends, you know, on uh, the reason. So um, to also encourage them, like I said, to follow rules and to, you know, think about, um, you know, what it was that they did and how they could uh, do things differently. You know, what would you have done differently? So know kind of use that as a guide okay okay well that is my last question thank you so much for your time and your presence today you're welcome okay uh thank you and quickly any board follow-up questions and seeing none i am now going to proceed to the conclusion of this matter First, Dr. Horton, are there any other documents, witnesses that you had intended to present today that you haven't yet provided? Uh, no. All right, and I'm going to invite you, and this is optional because uh, frankly, you've provided a lot of information through the questioning that's already happened, but if you wish to make any closing statement, I invite you to do so now. Um, I just wanna uh, thank everyone uh, for providing me with the forum to pre to be able to present my um, case. And um, I guess that's it. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. That That is fine. And Mr. Lent, I'm going to afford you this similar opportunity. If there's any closing summation you'd like to provide the board. Yes, Your Honor, if I may. Please. Thank you. The practice of psychology in California affects the public health, safety, and welfare, and is to be the subject to regulation as well as control in the public interest to protect the public from unauthorized and unqualified practices of psychology and from unprofessional conduct by persons licensed to practice psychology. In addition, uh, protection of the public shall be the highest priority of the Board of Psychology in exercising its licensing regulatory as well as disciplinary functions. Whenever the protection of the public is inconsistent with other interests sought to be promoted, the protection of the public shall be paramount. A person whose license has been placed on probation for more than three years, as was in this case, can petition the board for a termination of probation after a period of not less than two years have lapsed from that effective date of the decision ordering the disciplinary action. As the decision ordering the petitioner's discipline and probation in this matter became effective March 24th of 2019, and petitioner filed this petition March 24th of 2021, exactly two years to the date later, petitioner has timely filed her petition. However, it should be strongly noted that on the effective date of probation on March 24th of 2019, Probation was immediately told for a period of over seven months to October 30th of 2019, resulting in the petitioner serving less than one year and five months on active probation of a five-year probationary term before her petition for early termination was filed. In a proceeding involving a request for modification or early termination of probation, the burden at all times rests with the petitioner to prove that she has rehabilitated herself and is entitled to her probation modification or termination. The, petition, the standard uh, the petitioner must meet is that of clear and convincing evidence. The evidence presented by the petitioner must be considered in light of the moral shortcomings that previously resulted in her discipline. The showing must be sufficient to overcome the former adverse determination. 
In deciding whether to grant a petition for early termination of probation, among other things, the board must consider the nature and severity of the acts or crimes under consideration as grounds for the denial. Here, the nature and severity of the acts the petitioner committed are self-evident. Petitioner engaged in an ongoing and continuous series of criminal activities for over a decade from 1997 through 2009. The petitioner was 22 years old when she was first caught in 1997 and was 34 years of age in 2009 and thus cannot claim that such criminal conduct was based on youthful indiscretions. The seven criminal convictions spanning over 12 years demonstrate an escalation in both seriousness and moral turpitude, beginning with misdemeanor thefts and frauds perpetrated against the public and private citizens, culminating with the act of lying to a law enforcement officer and feloniously filing false evidence in a superior court of law. In each instance, the petitioner either served time in jail and or was placed on criminal probation with terms and conditions. In one instance, the petitioner violated her criminal probation, which resulted in her probation being revoked and being ordered to serve additional time in county jail. As noted earlier, for the seven crimes in which the petitioner was caught, prosecuted, and convicted, each of which are legally recognized as crimes of moral turpitude. Moral turpitude is legally defined as a general readiness to do evil and has been defined by many authorities as an act of baselessness, vileness, or depravity in the private and social duties which one man owes to his fellow men or to society in general, contrary to the accepted and customary rule of right and duty. A crime of moral turpitude is conduct that indicates dishonesty, bad character, a general readiness to do evil, or a moral depravity of any kind. The specific intent crimes of theft, fraud, and deceit clearly require a willful and knowing act with the intent to deceive and are therefore accurately characterized as crimes of moral turpitude. In reaching a decision on a disciplinary action under the administrative adjudication provisions of the Administrative Procedure Act, the board shall consider and apply the disciplinary guidelines and uniform standards related to substance abuse licensees which are incorporated into the board's regulations by reference. In deciding whether to grant a petition for early termination of probation, among other things, the board must consider the extent to which petitioner has demonstrated rehabilitation. According to the disciplinary guidelines, rehabilitation is evaluated according to an internal subjective measure of attitude, which is a state of mind, and an external objective measure of conduct, statement of facts. A state of mind demonstrating rehabilitation is one that has a mature, measured appreciation of the gravity of the misconduct and remorse for the harm caused. Petitioner must take responsibility for the misconduct and show an appreciation for why it is wrong. Petitioner must also show a demonstrated course of conduct that convinces and assures the board that the public would be safe if petitioner is permitted to be licensed. Dr. Thomas's psychological evaluation of the petitioner in this matter concluded that the petitioner's responses during her evaluation were defensive and that petitioner's assessment revealed, quote, little about her deeper psychological condition and experiences, but instead put forth a remarkably high level of self-perceived psychological adjustment, which according to Dr. Thomas, is inconsistent with petitioner's history and reported experiences, indicating a significant lack of insight and an inability or unwillingness to acknowledge the magnitude of her potential impairments. Petitioner's personality test was also problematic in that she denied problems or weaknesses and described herself as having very good adjustment with limited insight, both of which the petitioner has testified to today that she disputes and believes that she was fully rehabilitated in 2009. According to Dr. Thomas, petitioner also engaged in a series of cognitive distortions and rationalizations regarding her prior criminal conduct. Dr. Thomas further opined that petitioner has a relatively high susceptibility to succumb to depression or otherwise be symptomatic of engaging in psychotherapy with clients, which would have a negative impact on her clients as well as the petitioner and would likely reveal itself during a five-year probationary period. Dr. Thomas recommended that petitioner remain in psychotherapy for a period of five years in which transference and countertransference issues can be thoroughly addressed with psychotherapy, supervision, and a practice monitor. Dr. Thomas reiterated this same recommendation for a five-year period of supervision several times throughout her evaluation report. Petitioner testified today that she now contests the psychotherapy for a period of five years 
and disputes that she has any issues regarding transference and countertransference. Dr. Thomas also emphasized in her recommendation that petitioner should not miss, cancel, or not show to any psychotherapy appointments, and should she be required to do so to document in writing why the absences occurred and that the missed appointments need to be reported to her probation and her supervisor. Probationers quarterly psychotherapy progress notes by Dr. Sue demonstrates that over the limited time of active probation in which petitioner only started attending therapy in January of 2020, 48 sessions or roughly 75% of the 64 sessions she did attend were less than the one hour in violation of the one hour minimum probationary term requirement. And in at least 10 instances, or rather 16% of her sessions, she failed to appear or show up and failed to provide a written explanation as to why, per Dr. Thomas's evaluation and recommendations. Petitioner's last documented quarterly progress report by Dr. Sue, dated September 28, 2021, indicates an increase in her anxiety and fatigue as a result of her work and parenting duties, as well as a relationship dissensions petitioner experienced in her workplace. It is noted in that progress report that, quote, she made concerted efforts to avoid conflict, but still found herself embroiled in various disagreements. She had some difficulty in recognizing her role within these relationships and how her behavior can ameliorate or exacerbate different dynamics, end quote. This is further reflected in petitioner's therapy information sheet, which is exhibit two, AGO page 33, where her therapist, Dr. Scott Stu, states that petitioner has only built some insight into herself and understanding of others. Consequently, the Attorney General's office remains deeply concerned that the one year, five year, one year, five months the petitioner has been on active probation is an insufficient amount of time to adequately and properly address the rehabilitative issues identified in her psychological evaluation and that continue to persist in her psychotherapy today. It is also alarming that within that limited time on probation, petitioner has violated the terms of her probation by failing to complete her required coursework and failed to attend a vast majority of her psychotherapy sessions for a minimum of one hour as ordered, as ordered, despite an extensive history of familiar and familiarity with being on probation and being subject to terms and conditions with the California Board of Behavioral Sciences, as well as with the California Superior Court. It is also concerning that in spite of the importance petitioner psychotherapy plays in her continued rehabilitation, she initially had no intention to continue therapy after 2017. And since attending psychotherapy since, as ordered since January of 2020, she has failed to appear for 10 sessions or roughly 16% of her psychotherapy without written explanation as to why. This concern is further accentuated by petitioner's statement today in which she believes she was already rehabilitated before probation even started in this matter. Petitioner's toolbox to deal with stress and her stated support system consisting only of her boyfriend and two adult daughters is not well articulated. There is no mention or consideration given to her psychotherapist, professional colleagues, close friends, or pillars in the community. Most poignantly, it was petitioner's alleged reliance on familial influences that she attributes to a majority of her underlying disciplinary criminal conduct. Given these circumstances and the fact that petitioner exhibits only a limited amount of insight, the Attorney General's office recommends that the board deny the petition. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And I'm gonna give the last word in this hearing to Dr. Horton. There may have been matters that you had not addressed given the more recent closing statements by uh, Mr. Lent. So Dr. Horton, anything else you'd like to add at this time? Um, yes, I would. Um, I don't have the form in front of me, but it is my understanding that um, with being on probation, it was not mandatory that I attended once a week. Um, I think that my probation monitor had uh, said something to the effect as long as I attended uh, regularly. Um, the fact that I have a private practice and um, I have not had any complaints, any issues uh, with my current license is definitely reflective uh, that um, I'm not a threat uh, to society. 
um, I absolutely have insight on um, myself and my decision making. Um, to say that I'm not attributing um, therapy or any pillars in the community uh, to, um, you know, uh, my rehabilitation or I, I didn't write down what Mr. Lynch just said. Um, well, honestly, um, me attending therapy is helping me with my current stressors. Um, as I shared before, I have new stressors. That is why I said that I was going to continue therapy with having a private practice. Um, it has brought on an extreme amount of stress having to deal with insurance companies, me doing the billing, um, you know, um, me being responsive, responsible for the administrative duties is just a lot. Um, it is very different from uh, what I'm used to. So for that reason, I do plan to uh, continue uh, therapy. Uh, when I was on probation with the Board of Behavioral Science, in their decision, they indicated that I meet the criteria for rehabilitation, uh, which is contrary to what Mr. Lint uh, shared. Um, I take full responsibility for any and all actions that I have um, done in the past. Um, I have not uh, committed any type of crime uh, in over 12 years. Um, and that's something that Mr. Lint uh, failed to uh, comment on. Um, and I've actually been on active uh, probation. If you go from October uh, to October, that's uh, October of 2019 to October of 2021, that's two years. So it's been about two years and uh, uh, three months going on four months. Um, so I'm not sure of why uh, he keeps uh, saying that it's only been a year and five months because it, it's been a lot longer than that. Um, also, um, uh, Mr. Lint, uh, also, I think he was saying in the beginning that uh, the Board of Behavioral Science uh, told my probation, um, he has his facts uh, completely off. Um, so, um, I just want to leave uh, the board uh, with the statement that um, I definitely have learned uh, from my past decisions, uh, and that's reflected through me not uh, being convicted of any crimes. Um, I currently uh, am working uh, with the vulnerable population and have had my psych assistant registration uh, since, I guess you could say, and, and using it since October of 2019. And I've been licensed as a social worker since April of 2019. And I have not received not one complaint, not one uh, discipline uh, action outside of uh, this probation, I mean, in relation to me working with patients. Um, since receiving uh, my LCSW license and my psych assistant uh, registration, um, I haven't had any issues with my supervisor. Um, and uh, Dr. Veronica Thomas um, made, uh, I guess, her suggestion. She also indicated that I am not a threat uh, to the public. And so did Dr. Sherry Adrian. So, I mean, I guess that's it. I don't really, you know, know what to say uh, outside of that. Okay, Dr. Horton, thank you very much on behalf of the board. This concludes the petition hearing in this matter. The case is now submitted and the record is closed. So we are now off the record and I, 
look now to board president to um, direct in terms of next steps, whether the board will go in a closed session or take a break, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. Tate. Thank you, Your Honor. We will not be going to closed session at this time. We will take a five minute break. Um, and so we will convene at 1150 and we will go right into our regulatory hearing at that time. So come back at 1150, yeah, five minutes. Thank you. I hope that everyone is back. Ms. Prito, can you just call the roll so we can double check? Yes, of course. Thank you. Kasuga. Here. Cervantes. Here. Who? Here. Harb Sheets. Here. Nystrom. Here. Phillips. Here. Riscate. Here. Rogers. Here. Tate. Here. Rolls complete. Perfect. Thanks to everyone for your patience. Just to let you know where we are headed, we're going to take up agenda item number six, go into lunch, and then hear another petition at 1.30. And we can take up the petition issues in closed session later this afternoon. Agenda item number six is uh, the public hearing pursuant to code 11346.8 related to psychologist fees California Psychology Law and Ethics Examination, and Initial License and Biannual Renewal Fee. My name is Dr. Leah Tate, and I'm the president of the California Board of Psychology, and I will be conducting this hearing. Today's date is February 17th, 2022, and this hearing is beginning at approximately 11.51 a.m. This is the time and place set for the Board of Psychology to conduct a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Regulatory Section 1392 of Title 16 of the California Code of Regulations relative to fees. The purpose of this hearing is to receive oral and written testimony concerning the regulatory proposal. To ensure fairness and a complete record, the following procedures will be followed. This proceeding is being recorded. Please identify yourself by name and group you're representing if you wish to do so. Although it is voluntary, the board requests that you do so in order that we may provide you with any modified text as required by the Administrative Procedure Act. If necessary, the amount of time each person has for oral testimony may be limited. If you agree with another individual's testimony, you may simply indicate your agreement on the record and need not repeat the testimony. All written testimony should be submitted to the board. Written testimony may be summarized orally, but please do not read it into the record. The board will not respond to objections or recommendations at this hearing, but may ask questions to obtain clarification. Responses will be provided by the board tomorrow, February 18th, 2022, when we consider adopting the text as noticed. In addition, responses will be included in a final statement of reasons that will be filed with the Office of Administrative Law and posted on the board's website. A complete copy of the rulemaking file will be available for review at the board's office in Sacramento. I now ask that all persons who desire to testify, please do so by stating so in the comment box on your screen. This is the moderator at the direction of the board. I've opened up the Q&A feature for comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please go ahead and click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right-hand corner of your WebEx screen. Uh, this is the moderator. Uh, seeing no requests for comment, would you like me to close that Q&A feature? 
Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, please. That'd be great. All right. So that concludes our regulations hearing. Is it appropriate to ask um, for any board comment at this time? Ms. Bond? Hi, I'm going to um, defer to your regulatory counsel uh, for, for how to close the hearing here. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Heather Hoganson, your reg counsel here. Um, the board comments can be will be done tomorrow as the agendized item uh, in response yes. to the written comments as well. Okay, so I can close the hearing at this time. Yes. Thank you. The time is now 11.55 a.m. Since there are no individuals that have requested to speak at this time, the hearing is now closed. So at this time, I think that we should break for lunch. I don't think any board member will oppose that. And hmm, I'm trying to think. And we need to resume at, oh, you know what? Let's take up some other items. I didn't realize it was just 12 noon. Mr. Glassbeagle, can you please give us your budget report, please? This is agenda item number 18. Absolutely. I'm also uh, working the slides for this, so I'm. <laughs> it's okay. 12, 14, almost there. It should be slide 32. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Good uh, morning, board members. Included in your meeting materials is the budget report, uh, also agenda item 18. The governor's budget for 21-22 uh, after the January 10th current year changes. Uh, the board now has an appropriation of $7,171,000. At the end of this fiscal year, the board is estimated to revert 0.62% uh, of its budget or roughly $44,000. Um, included in the materials is a budget report through fiscal month six, uh, which would be December, a fund condition statement, and then projected versus actual expenditures and revenue. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Does any board member have any questions for Mr. Glassbeagle? Let's open up public comment for the budget report, please. This is a moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a comment on this item, please uh, go ahead and click that Q&A icon located at the bottom right hand corner of your WebEx screen. Um, and while we're waiting for um, public, I do see that uh, board member Phillips has his hand raised. Indeed, I do. I just wanted to um, clarify with you, Mr. Glassbeagle. Clearly, the structural imbalance still exists despite the reversion. That is correct. And we are slowly draining the psychology fund? That is correct. And when is it expected that we're going to run out of uh, psychology fund and we'll be running at a deficit? Uh, based on the fund condition we were most recently provided, it looks like we will be at a negative fund balance uh, in fiscal year 23-24, which would start July 1st of 2023. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, this is the moderator. Uh, seeing no requests for public comment, would you like me to close that Q&A feature? Absolutely, and thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Glassbeagle. 
Okay, new plan. It is 12 noon. We're gonna break for lunch, come back at 1245 for closed session, and we will be in closed session until our petition hearing at 1.30. So you have 45 minutes to get your life together and get your lunch, and then we'll meet back here at 1245 for closed session. Thank you. Um, Madam President, um, for the this is um, Mr. Fu here. And when we go to closed session, I think you need to um, share for what purpose we're going into closed session. Um, Correct. <laughs> The board will meet in closed session pursuant to government code section 11126 C3 to discuss disciplinary matters, including the above petition, proposed decisions, stipulations, petitions for reconsideration and remands. And thank you for the reminder, Mr. Fu. Did that cover it? I think so. Um, no. Ms. Bond? <laughs> I think you're good, Dr. Tate. Perfect. See everyone at 1245. I appreciate it.